imagine having to put your friend in a body bag and then carry him through the jungle. All the while you were fighting an enemy you cannot see. The conflict in Vietnam was as much against the terrain as it was the Viet Cong. At 22 years old, Robin Bartlett assumed leadership of the 1st Platoon, A Company, 1st Battalion, 5th Cavalry, 1st Cavalry Division, Airmobile, where he led a platoon of over 60 helicopter combat assaults and search and destroy missions. In civilian life, Bartlett worked in national and international C-suite level sales and marketing. He has served on the board of the Independent Book Publishing Association, Health Marketing and Communications Council, and the Friends of the Library of Medicine. And he is the past president of the American Medical Publishers Association. His book, Vietnam Combat, Firefights and Writing History, is available now on Amazon. Welcome, Robin. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So growing up in a military family, I imagine the pressure was really great for you to join too. Is that why you volunteered instead of being drafted? Um, not exactly. There was a lot of pressure. My grandfather went to West Point. My father went to West Point. My brother went to West Point. I had an appointment to West Point. But after 13 elementary and middle schools and four high schools, I said I'd had enough of the military. But in college, at the age of 18, during the summer, I got a draft notice. So I said, mm -hmm. oh, I don't want to be drafted. And of course, I had to serve my obligation as an officer. That was required. I went into the ROTC program, and it was just second nature to me. Because it was second nature, and at the ripe age of 21, not knowing what I wanted to do with my life and wanting to challenge myself with the most challenging thing I could think of, I volunteered Airborne Ranger and 82nd Airborne Division, the whole, the whole nine yards. It's hard to believe. It's been nearly 50 years since yeah. the end of the Vietnam War. And too many today probably look at it as a paragraph in a history book. How would you explain it to someone in their 20s today and why the U.S. were there? Well, it, it is, has been 50 years. Actually, the, the official date is March the 29th. That marks the Vietnam Veterans War Day as proclaimed originally by Barack Obama. That was the day that the last days were released from North Vietnam and also the last American troops left Vietnam. Now, the war continued for another two years as the South tried to fight against the North Vietnamese superior forces. But if I were trying to, and it's difficult because I have, in fact, tried to talk to some younger people about the war, and they kind of get it confused a little bit with Korea. They're not really sure. It's all vague. They've seen some movies wanted to know how accurate the movies are. But Vietnam veterans today are starting to walk in the boots of the World War II veterans. There are very, very few World War II veterans left. They're all in their late 90s, early 100s. Many of them, you know, are no longer mobile. And Vietnam veterans are and Korean veterans are walking in their boots. And Vietnam veterans in particular we're not welcomed back. For the most part, we're not welcomed back from that war. And the general consensus within America at the time was that we lost the war. And Vietnam veterans often bear the brunt of that, of that opinion by the Americans at that point in time. It's shifted, it's changed, but it's important today for young people to understand about the Vietnam War and learn the lessons of that war. Why? So that we don't repeat them. Yeah. So that we don't repeat them in Afghanistan and Iraq and Iran. But we seem to do it anyway. I know. I'm afraid to say. I was the first televised war too, which made it a little more front and center than, say, the Korean War. There is probably similarities, I understand, with the terrain. But one of the things where it kind of went south with popularity was the 
there was so much emphasis placed on the massacre at My Lai. And I think the sad part about it is that many of the veterans were lumped into that terrible situation. But also, I had talked to a Vietnam vet, and that very question gets asked a lot. I was actually devastated by his answer when I asked him, which movie do you think portrays the closest to what it was like there? And he said, Hamburger Hill. And I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> you couldn't get worse than that. The interesting thing was about Vietnam, though, is it was four different wars in one. Yeah. Depending upon where you were. And it's also important to understand that Vietnam is a little bit like the state of California, if you flip it around. And the enemy could go into Oregon, they could go into Nevada, they could go into Arizona, but we had to stay within the state of California. And then depending upon where you are, if you were down in the Delta in South Southern Vietnam, you were in streams and they were, it was a river, river war. If you were up in the North where I was, the, right along the demilitarized zone, if you were out toward the Gulf of Tonkin, it was tumbleweed and sand and rolling hills. And then as you got closer to the Laotian border, it was three canopy jungle. One day we could be in sand and no overhead cover. And the next day in deep, thick jungle with no trails and just cutting your way. Yeah. And that elephant grass was pretty special. <laughs> we called a lot of the brush, wait a minute vines. Yeah, there were uh, at least around 10,000 Indians that actually served That's in right. Vietnam. And although to this day, they've never really been recognized because Canada wasn't in that war. So these people had to create literally fake addresses in the U.S. in order to serve. Do you know of any other countries that also did the same? Well, there were uh, Australians. And there was a pretty substantial Australian commitment of a couple of brigades, if I'm not mistaken. And also South Korea had some forces there as well. Those are the only ones I know of. I, I never served with any other troops at all. And in yeah. fact, rarely, only on one occasion did I ever work with South Vietnamese soldiers. I've spoken also to a Canadian Aboriginal person, and he had served in Vietnam as a scout. Yeah. But finding the stories at that time, there's more now, but finding like books and stories about some of like the scouts, the native scouts, and some of those aspects of the war, and even just the human side of it, they were difficult at the beginning, but it's nice to see you talking about this. I have a classmate who was the leader of a scout dog unit. And scout dogs and alert dogs were used extensively in certain areas of Vietnam, and they were welcome additions. They, it seemed as if they were incredibly adept at noticing uh, booby traps before we walked into them, and also alerting to the potential for enemy forces in deep jungle, where you might only be able to see five meters in front of you, 10 meters in front of you. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. The minute the dog alerted, they walked to the back and we had to move. Yeah, forward. right. They're not dumb. <laughs> you go ahead. No, no, no. That's not my job. <laughs> Only to alert. That's it. That's awesome. So the Tet Offensive, that is probably one of the most pop, not, I shouldn't say popular, but the most well-known. Can you describe it and this significant loss of life? And did anyone really win that? Well, in, in terms of body count, we certainly won it. I mean, the North Vietnamese came away with uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 80,000 soldiers killed. But from a political point of view, it was a victory for North Vietnam because yeah. the surprise attack and the significance of attacking the American embassy, successfully attacking the American embassy. I actually arrived in Vietnam shortly after that, and I had been in the 82nd Airborne Division, and they wanted to keep officers who were in the Airborne, also in Airborne units. So I was assigned to the 101st Airborne Division. I got into Vietnam, and they said, forget it. All orders are for officers are canceled. There have been so many officer casualties. 
you are now going to the 1st Cavalry Division, which actually turned out to be a great assignment in many ways because we had more helicopter support than any other unit, which meant you got to carry less on your back. You could carry more ammunition, more water, but it also meant that they could helicopter you in. It's called a combat assault, helicopter combat assault. Concept of the Air Mobile concept was to bring fresh troops right directly to the enemy as opposed to having to walk through the jungle or something to find them. And we did. That's exactly what we did. And Vietnam had its own special hell. Every war is terrible, but Vietnam you had a special hell to it with Agent Orange and all the chemicals that were supposedly there to help the American troops, but ended up making them the one, ones that suffered. How... And you've probably seen some terrible things. How can you even put a description on this war and how terrible it was? Well, speaking about Agent Orange, I did walk through some areas that had been sprayed with Agent Orange. And it was very obvious because it looked as if it was fall. You know, the leaves were all on the ground. The trees were bare. And yet it was summertime. For the audience sake, Agent Orange was spread over by helicopter, right? So that it would, or by defoliate. Yeah, to defoliate because the area was so thick. And like you said, you couldn't see more than five inches in front of you. But uh, for example, we were forbidden to drink water from streams, even to purify it for that reason. And they actually had to fly us water on a fly us water out on a daily basis in the evening wow. and you would go through at least a gallon of water a day maybe sometimes even more it was not unusual to be out of water by two or three in the afternoon and we carried two gallons everybody every man carried two gallons of water but we were forbidden to drink the water if we came to a stream all we could do is just wet down we had uh, towels and that sort of thing that we would wet ourselves down and cool off but not to not allowed to drink the water yeah, um, and that could be a problem because I imagine it was pretty damn hot there too. <laughs> oh, it was. Absolutely. 105 to 115 oh, average daily temperatures. And it was not uncommon, even for men who were had acclimatized, had been in Vietnam, to have heat stroke or heat exhaustion and have to be medevaced on a regular basis. I would lose men and they'd be back in the rear for a couple of days and then come back to join us. It was not unusual. But um, I think that I think Agent Orange was one of those mistakes that sounded like a really great idea at the time will do away with the jungle and you know it's come back to haunt us come back to haunt a lot of soldiers yeah for decades to come and the enemy was really invisible because of that terrain i can't even imagine what it would be like to walk or try to figure out where they were when you couldn't see them and then also the civilian they hid inside the civilian population too didn't they? they did the Viet Cong would hide inside the civilian population and on on one occasion my unit was in a blocking force around a village that was being searched by a South Vietnamese unit and, but that was pretty much as close as I got to any civilians we were in areas that were free fire zone any Anything that walked, anything that moved, you killed it. They were not supposed to be there. They were enemy, end of story. Yeah. What was unusual was to that you became attuned to as you walked through jungle, especially toward the Laotian border where they loved the North Vietnamese Army and, South, and Viet Cong owned the night. That's when they moved. That's when they attacked. They owned the night. And we stopped. We would always set up a fire base for the night and sleep and pull guard duty. They didn't. That's when they fought and that's when they attacked us. But as you walked through the jungle, you became attuned to the noises and the smells. Mm. The smells were difficult because we didn't get clean clothes for about four to six weeks at a time. Oh, so goodness. we smelled pretty bad too. <laughs> but if you were walking through the jungle and you didn't hear any monkeys and you didn't hear any birds, it was a it was a cause for alarm. And on one occasion, my point man alerted, called me forward, and he said, 
do you smell what I smell? And we had walked into an enemy base camp. It was abandoned. But oh, we no. walked into the latrine. Yeah. And we smelled the latrine. So that was how we discovered this. It was so well camouflaged that we had not seen it. We literally walked into the latrine and that's how we discovered it. Wow. Wow. <laughs> that smells. <laughs> I Yeah. And that also says a lot about how much you kind of get used to your own smell, I guess, after yep. so many days that you wouldn't necessarily smell that until you came right upon it. That's right. <laughs> Very wow. true. I always wonder about that too, when you even just watching the dramatic portrayals of war and movies and whatnot, you don't get to bath every day because you're out in that field, you know, days on I end. That's something everybody takes for granted every day in civilian life. And <laughs> it's not the longest not I the went case. at one time without clean clothes was six weeks. Oh. And they finally brought clothes out to us. And I was late getting to the clean clothes. So the only pair of pants that was left was small. And I wore a medium. And <laughs> so I had to put on the small pants, which lasted about two or three days until I stepped over a log and ripped out the crotch. Yeah. <laughs> and you didn't wear underwear in Vietnam. Yeah, it was too yeah. hot. So the chapter in my book describing this activity is called Letting It All Hang Out. <laughs> and of course, if you've got Agent Orange in the water, do you even risk bathing in it? Because oh, yeah, I mean, sure. you that, take that your... no problem. No? Okay. You, you okay. use the water to wash well, At least off you had that. Water. You could dip with your clothes on, dip yourself in there and maybe, although foot rot was an issue too, wasn't it? It was. Not so much in my area, but down south where there was a lot of rice paddies and that sort of thing, where men were constantly wet, constantly walking through water. That was a problem. Yeah. We just had when, blisters and yeah. and heat. And then you got to walk with those blisters. When it was over and you came back, how difficult was it for you? We hear these stories too. I know my father never spoke about the war when he came back, ever. Sure leave, yeah. <laughs> Lots of Shirley stories, but never the war. How difficult was it to integrate back into society? And people never really see or appreciate how hard it is. And not just for those that served in Vietnam either, but it was, it was a difficult time. Well, it wasn't so bad for me, primarily because I was a regular army officer and I had an additional assignment to go to. And, and actually my father was an air force colonel. Well, I don't know how he did it, but he actually, I could not tell them exactly what day I was going to come back, only kind of gave him a period of time. But so he and my mother went to Travis air force base and they met every returning flight coming back wow. and uh, I arrived at 11 o'clock at night I looked out the window of the plane and I saw two people standing on wow. the other side of the fence with the dog <laughs> and I said those are my parents I know it wow and they were there to meet me wow so they kind of protected me and uh, then I went on to my next duty assignment which was in Alaska which actually turned out to be a good duty assignment but Nobody wanted to hear about the war. Nobody wanted no. to know about the war. Nobody wanted, even in my military community, there was no interest whatsoever. Nobody wanted to talk about it, discuss it. So you bottled it up. And that's the worst thing too. It plays on your psyche and you internalize all the trauma and that's where everybody turns to alcohol. And that's why we see so many homeless veterans, I think, because of that. It's true. I Terrible. suffered with some PTSD for a good 20 years. I kept it all bottled up, liken it to having a titanium steel trunk in the back of my mind. <laughs> but after about yeah. 20 years, some of that stuff started leaking out. And I actually had to go see a good friend of mine who was a psychiatrist who gave me some helpful tips that brought me through some of that tough stuff. Were you ever offered any support? No. Yeah, I didn't think no. so. They don't um, really offer support today either. <laughs> very little. VA is trying to do something about that, but it's not significant at all. I don't believe. 
So how did you see this experience shape your life? Oh, it shaped my life dramatically, mostly in terms of emotion, empathy. My wife tells me that my greatest strength is that I am fearless. And she tells me my greatest weakness is that I am fearless. And, <laughs> and my training and my experience, in fact, caused me to really become fearless. Uh, and, and that has helped me a great deal in my civilian career. And it's hurt me. Mm -hmm. uh, for the longest, and I attribute my wife for kicking me in the rear end on a regular basis to say, you know, you need to grab your son and hug him and tell him these magic words, I love you, because a lot of that just evaporated from me. And I had to work at reconnecting with my colleagues, mm -hmm. my family, and becoming the person that I was before. To this day, I still struggle some with that. What Tough guy. You see that a lot with others who served as well. So what can the today's service people, what can they learn from that conflict in Vietnam? How can that history of Vietnam help them today? Well, I'm the president of the New York, New Jersey chapter of the First Cab Division Association, and we have mostly Vietnam veterans. And we've been trying to get Afghanistan and, and those soldiers to come. But if they're out of the service now, they're all establishing just same as I did, you know, yeah. starting families, working on their civilian careers. They don't have time. And the VFWs and the American Legions are all catering to the older Vietnam, older veterans. My advice would simply be, you've got to talk about it. You've got yeah. to meet with other veterans who can share your story and share your pain and get it out, get it out. It's tough. It is very hard to talk about, but unless you do, you'll carry, uh, I likened it to the wonderful story, at Christmas Carol, where they talk about dragging your chains behind you. And that mm. is the analogy, you drag those chains behind you for the rest of your life. And you've got to start clipping off some of those links. And the only way to clip them off is to face it and talk about it. And I still have a few of those links to clip off, but I've made some progress. Yeah, and in, in the case of what we're seeing today in Ukraine, you've got the civilians are facing as much conflict as as the servicemen sure. um, so they're going to have to go through it as well what can uh, this... the same kind of ptsd that i think firefighters and police and s people face on a regular basis it's very hard yeah. and physicians too very hard to deal with yeah and for your own survival you have to talk about it i think that's the only it's either that or you just go see some psychiatrist and get a lot of counseling yeah maybe both what can the civilian population do to help their friends and family and strangers who have come back from a conflict zone? Well, as pertains to Vietnam veterans, I mean, the standard statement in the National Vietnam Veterans Day is coming up on March 29th. But the standard, when you see someone wearing a hat or you, you see some sort of military insignia, you always say, thank you for your service. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's appreciated. But if it's a Vietnam veteran and you really want to make an impression, if you really want to stop them and bring tears to their eyes <laughs> and a lump to their throat, you say, welcome home. And you will, mm. you will stop them. Words are so powerful, so meaningful. And especially coming from a young person, it has 10 times the impact of thank you for your service. Oh, wow. That is such you great. You can recognize us. We're getting old. We have lots of wrinkles. That is great advice. Yeah, that, that hit me too. Thank you so much for this. I appreciate it. And I could talk for I, days I will, about this. Topic. I will mention that my website has a lot more information. Huh. People would like to come visit and uh, take a look. It's www.robinbartlettauthor.com. Thank you so much. Thank you.